And all God's people said, amen. 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 It is so good to see you today. Last weekend, uh, I was at Cattell Cove about this time, shivering in a sleeping bag. It was cold. If you've never tent camped with your family of six, let me encourage you. It's a good idea. It was a lot of fun, though. It's a beautiful, beautiful place that we live in, and it was fun. We had a good time. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. And if you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you'll find Isaiah 61 on page 737. And as always, look, if you don't have a Bible that you could read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. Scratch out Calvary, write in your name, call it your own, read it in the morning, read it in the afternoon, read it in the evening. Whenever you read it, read it, then apply it to your life. We are firmly convinced here at Calvary that if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will change our lives And we love celebrating life change. We love celebrating what happens when God works in our hearts. Today we are continuing in our sermon series from Isaiah. And today we get to unpack a little bit of an expression that you've heard Pastor Chad and I say over and over again, at least for the last two and a half years. You've heard us say, God is for you. And today as we look at Isaiah 61, you're going to be able to write down notes and understand exactly what we mean when we say God is for you. Now, this passage of Scripture is a prophetic passage of Scripture about Jesus. It was written about 700 years before he came. What I mean by prophetic is they are words about Jesus that Jesus fulfilled. They were written anywhere from 400 to thousands of years before Jesus came. But when Jesus came, he fulfilled that prophecy. In the, New, in the Old Testament, there are over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament with his life. And this is one of them. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you have questions or confusion about who Jesus is, if you've wondered what his life was all about, today's passage will sum up the life of Jesus. Now for clarity, you're gonna be reading from the English Standard Version. I'm gonna be reading from the New Living Translation, but you're able to follow along with me. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. And their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Now, the very first thing that we should see in this passage of scripture, since it's written about Jesus, is that Jesus had a very clear and distinct purpose for his life. Jesus did not come to cause people to live in fear or to create more fear and chaos in their lives. And that's important for us to recognize because sometimes people think that Jesus came to control behavior of people, that the church and Jesus exist to control people's uh, behavior patterns, not to help them live in freedom. Sometimes that people think that Jesus and the church exists just to point out the flaws of everybody that ever walks through her doors. That the church is filled with people just judging other people, judging people for what they wear, judging people for what they say, judging people for what they do. And people think that that's what Jesus did. They don't understand the purpose of Jesus was to show compassion and mercy and forgiveness and to restore lives. And unfortunately, some churches 
try to, uh, try to conform people into looking and acting a certain way. And it ends up hurting people and pushing people away from the church. And can I tell you, that's not who we want to be at, at Calvary. That's not who Jesus was. That's not who God is. And if you've experienced that type of church, I want you to know I'm sorry for that. Because as a church, we want to pattern the mission of Jesus. So in this passage, I hope you clearly see that Jesus is for you. Jesus is for you. And that, that, that's a truth that goes against what many people think about Jesus. Some people think and they're convinced that God is against them. God's not for them, that God is actually against them. Every time something bad happens to them in their life, they blame God. Every time they experience something bad, something negative, they look up to the sky and say, God, why did you do this? Why did you let this happen to me? Why are you doing this to me? Why did you let my spouse get diagnosed with this? Why did, you let my Why did you let this happen to my children? Why did you let me experience job loss? God, why are you doing this to me? People blame God when something bad happens to them because somehow... For some reason, they think that the God who created them, the God who loves them, the God who has given them life, the God who sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for their sins, somehow they think that this God, who has got over seven billion and a half people on the planet, has a personal vendetta against them. That for some reason, God has a grudge against them. That God wants them to fail, that God dangles something good in front of their life for a little bit and then snatches it away and rubs his hands with glee. Can I tell you, that is not who God is. Before I surrendered my life to Jesus, I used to think that God was just like that. I can remember looking up to the sky and saying, God, why did you let my dad get cancer? God, why did you let my dad abuse me? God, why did you let my parents divorce? God, why did you let me experience this bad thing in life? Maybe before you became a follower of Jesus, you thought along those same lines. Maybe you used to think like that. Maybe you used to blame God whenever something bad or negative would happen in your life. So time for confession time. Raise your hand if you used to blame God for the bad stuff that happened in your life. All right, now raise your hand if nowadays you blame your spouse. <laughs> Sorry if you're single. Don't blame God though, just blame yourself. So Jesus began his ministry roughly 700 years after that passage was written. And here's something really cool. At the very beginning of his ministry, he is sitting in a synagogue in Nazareth and the religious leaders are in there. They'd never heard of Jesus. They didn't know who he was. They walk over and they hand him Isaiah 61 on a scroll. They hand it to him and invite him to read it to the rest of the synagogue. So Jesus takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He walks up to the front of the room. He opens up the scroll and he reads the words that I just read to you. But then, then immediately after he read it, he said something to them that made their jaws drop. Luke 4 verse 20. After he read it, he rolled up the scroll handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All the eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus said, this prophetic passage of scripture that teaches about the purpose of him, the purpose of the Messiah, the purpose of the Savior was fulfilled that day. That passage tells us and describes to us 
what Jesus came to do. And we can see the very first way that Jesus is for you is that number one, he brings good news. He brings good news. We live in a world today that has forgotten what good news is. We stop celebrating good news because we just love to focus on the negative. We love to focus on the bad news. I love receiving good news. I don't know if you do or not. Last week, I picked up, uh, the week before last, I picked up Jessie from school and Jessie came running to me. She's my youngest, she's seven years old. She came running to me. She reached into her backpack and she pulled out good news. She pulled out the honor roll and she's like, dad, look, look, look. So it's been hanging on our refrigerator since because it's good news. Our refrigerator is covered. I have four daughters. Our refrigerator is covered with uh, tests that are good news. When they score something good, it's on the refrigerator. And you know what we do with the bad news grades? We don't hang them on the refrigerator. We don't even talk about them. We're like, oh, okay, that's terrible. But we don't want to discourage them. So we focus on the good. He brings good news. Last week, Christy and I heard that a friend of ours from Arkansas got a kidney transplant. And the reason why that's good news is because three years ago, I led our church in Arkansas to raise money for him as a love offering. And we raised close to $50,000 to help he and his family so he could get on the recipient list and he could receive a kidney. And then six months went by and then a year went by and a year and a half and two years and two and a half years went by and then a living donor stepped forward and said, hey, I got two kidneys. You can use one of them. Do you know why that's good news? That's good news. It's good news because he was turning yellow. It's good news because his body was breaking down. It's good news because his wife got her husband back. It's good news because their little boys got their daddy back and their daddy's going to grow old with them prayerfully. Their daddy's going to grow old with them and experience a healthy life. That is good news. And if you've been to your oncologist and your oncologist after fighting years of cancer has given you a clean bill of health and you ring that bell, that is good news. It's good news to hear the stories of reconciliation between a husband and a wife. It's good news to hear the stories of how God is bringing children back to their parents. And after years of hurt and years of isolation, God's bringing healing and reconciliation. These are good news that flow from Jesus. And if you're a follower of Christ, if you've already surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've already committed your life to him, there's some good news that Jesus wants me to speak to you today. God's anger over your disobedience and sin is over. God's anger over your rebellion has been dealt with. If you're a follower of Jesus, all of God's bad news, all of God's wrath over sin was poured out on Jesus at the cross 2,000 years ago as he hung and died. Romans 8, 1 says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Say no condemnation for those in Christ. Man, it's so important to remember because if you've been following Jesus for a long time, sometimes what happens is guilt returns, sin returns, shame returns, and years can go by of you being weighed down by remorse, by guilt, by a sense of hopelessness, and God wants you to understand that he is not condemning you for your sin. You've You've already experienced freedom. You've already been set free. God's wrath over sin, past, present, and future has already poured, been poured out on Jesus. It has been sufficiently dealt with. Now he's called you to live in freedom. Now, since he's made you holy, he just wants you to live a holy life. 
because you've already been set free from sin. And that is good news. Now, secondly, secondly, we see another way that Jesus is for you. He comforts the brokenhearted. He comforts the brokenhearted. Now, this statement does not mean that Jesus simply comforts the sad, right? If you're feeling sad, Jesus comforts you. Like it's a nice thought, but that's not exactly what that translation or that's not exactly what Isaiah intended to communicate. The word in Hebrew for comfort means to gather together and to wrap up. Okay, that's what that word means for comfort. So he sent me to gather together and wrap up what? The brokenhearted. Well, in Hebrew, the word for brokenhearted means crushed into pieces and destroyed. So Jesus' purpose in life is to gather together and wrap up those who are crushed to pieces and destroyed. If you've ever felt broken, if you've ever felt shattered, if you've ever felt like the pieces of your life are, are just shattered and broken into thousands of pieces, if you've ever felt like your world has come crashing down around you, Jesus' mission in life is to grab those pieces, wrap you up, and piece your life back together. Now, here's the deal. Since Jesus is for you, he's not going to make your life what it was before. The life that he wraps up and puts back together your life will not be the same. When Jesus comforts you, when Jesus gathers together the shattered pieces of your life, you are not going to look like the same person. Why? Because there's a reason why your life broke in the first place. What kind of loving God would wrap you back together, put you back together and say, there you go, all fixed. You're just like you were before. No, when he puts you back together, he makes you different. He makes you new. See, many people, when they're walking through a tragedy, when they're walking through a dark valley, they want God to whisper to them, there, there, I'm gonna fix everything and make you okay. And I'm gonna make your life exactly like what it was before. But when God binds up our lives, when God wraps up the shattered, broken, ugly, hurting pieces of our life, he transforms us into something new. And since Jesus is for you, when he comforts you, that means some of the change that you might experience is he's going to strengthen your inner being. He's going to strengthen your resolve. He's gonna strengthen your ability to say, you know what? I will not walk this way any longer. This is a path that leads to destruction, but I'm gonna choose this path. He may even choose to, to use programs like Celebrate Recovery that meet every Monday night at six o'clock. I love my CR people. Every Monday night at six o'clock to help people who struggle with habits, hangups, and hurts in their life. That's, how, that's a way that God wraps himself around you, pulls the pieces of your life back together and says, you're not going to be the same person that you were. He's going to make you different. And the reason why he's going to make you different is because Jesus is for you. And thirdly, we see this. He freed people from sin. Now the verse says this in verse one, and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. I want you to be assured Jesus is not the A-team that goes around the country busting people out of prison. I was born in the 70s, so I grew up watching 80s television. And I love watching the A-team. 
I love listening to B.A. Baraka. See, I pity the fool. Put me on that plane. <laughs> Murdoch, give me that glass of milk, right? I loved, I love watching the A-team and everywhere they went, they're busting people out of prison. They're rescuing hostages. They're rescuing those who are kidnapped. This passage does not mean that Jesus is going to bust the inmates out of prison today. That's not what he's talking about. When Isaiah wrote this passage, prisoners will be freed, translated to eyes will be opened. Eyes will be opened. Isn't that interesting? Every one of us in here have eyes that are open right now unless you've fallen asleep. Every one of us in here have eyes that are open. So what does he mean? As a husband, my wife has many times asked me to do something and go somewhere that no man should ever go. She has asked me to retrieve something from her purse. <laughs> I have taken her purse on numerous times I have sat it down on the counter and I have looked for my car key that she says is inside the purse. And I have it open and I'm looking in every zipper, hidden zipper, zippers in public, the side zippers, all around. I've dug deep into the caverns of that purse and I've come up short every single time. And I take the purse back, I plop it on the counter, I say, it's not in there. My key's not in there. Without looking, my wife goes, Zip. what are you, blind? And my condition is so severe that it actually impacts things that I'm looking for in the refrigerator as well. When my wife says it's in the refrigerator, it is not in the refrigerator. And I hear the expression as she comes up and pulls it off the, fir the first shelf. What are you, blind? It happens with things in the pantry. It happens with things in the garage. I see with my eyes, but I don't see what she's talking about. Raise your hand if that has ever happened to you. <laughs> Receiving forgiveness for sin is exactly like that. When Jesus says, I'm gonna open up their eyes or set the captives free, that is exactly what receiving forgiveness is for sin is like. Before I surrendered my life to Jesus in 1991, I had heard all about him. I never understood how to surrender my life to him until I was 18 years old. That's when my eyes were opened. That is when I was set free. And if you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you've not yet committed your life to him, I would love to be able to say, that's because you've not yet made that choice. But the reality is there's something spiritual going on that you don't understand right now. There's something spiritual happening in your life that you don't fully understand. The reality is as much as you hear about forgiveness, you can't comprehend it. You can't see it. The Apostle Paul wrote and described why people have not yet surrendered their lives to Jesus in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And he said this, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message. If you're somebody who has not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, the reality is it's because Satan has darkened your mind. You don't understand forgiveness. You are blindfolded. You are held captive. You are held hostage by the evil one who hates God, who hates this whole idea of forgiveness, and who absolutely hates you. So how do you know if you're one that is blindfolded and held in darkness? Well, your life 
kind of looks like this. You keep hearing that Jesus is for you. You keep hearing about how God created you and loves you. You keep hearing about how we chose to sin and reject God and the consequences for sin is separation from God. And since God is just and fair, the price for sin must be paid. You keep hearing that. You keep hearing about how Jesus paid the price for your sin on the cross, that he died and that he rose from the dead and that the penalty for the sin of the world, including yours and mine, was paid, you keep hearing that all you have to do is surrender your life to Jesus. But weekend after weekend, conversation after conversation, and day after day, you never surrender to God. It's because you're seeing, but you're not perceiving. You're hearing, but you're not understanding. Satan has blinded your mind so you cannot see the beauty of forgiveness and the beauty of hope and the love that God has for you. Satan does not want you to see what you were created to be. And can I tell you, as a pastor, you are a precious human being that, that God loves, he has created, and you don't, have to be, you don't have to settle for being held against your will. You don't have to settle for being blindfolded and held in captivity. Ask God to remove the blinders from your mind. Ask God to remove the blindfold from your heart so that you can understand the message of the gospel. Ask God to remove that veil of darkness, rip it out of your mind and let you see the light of Jesus. And you can ask him to do that right now. If you continually reject the gospel, what happens is you get a callous growing in your heart. And eventually, the good news of Jesus means nothing. So ask God to let you see right now. Say, God, just let me see the light of Jesus. Let me see forgiveness. So now let me ask you this. Will you allow Jesus to exchange your grief for his joy? Will you allow Jesus to exchange your grief for his joy? Look at the last few, uh, few words of verse three. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes. Now think about that. Ashes are something that once was. It's been burned up. It's been consumed. Now it's just nothing. And you know what Jesus is going to give you in exchange for ashes? A crown of beauty. You know what that crown of beauty was? A crown of righteousness. He's going to give you a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. This entire passage highlights the purpose of Jesus' ministry. And it shows essentially what Jesus has done for you and I. It is the greatest exchange that has ever occurred in the history of the world. Symbolically, this closing verse points to what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. And it's my prayer that if you just ask God to open up your eyes and remove the blinders, that you would now see 2 Corinthians 5.21, the powerful truth that's there. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Let me explain what happened. This greatest exchange, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was holy. Jesus never sinned. On the cross, he became sin so that God as a just God could pour his wrath out for disobedience on Jesus. The price was paid. It was dealt with. He became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus took sin, became sin, and gave you his perfection. He gave you his holiness. 
That's the greatest exchange that's ever occurred. Holy God became sin. So you and I could become holy. So have you surrendered your life to Jesus? He takes the painful, the hurtful life that sin has brought us and he gives us something of far greater value than we could ever possibly know. He gives us his perfection. He gives us his holiness. He gives us forgiveness of sin. Have you received his forgiveness? Seeing, maybe for the first time, what's been right in front of you for many years. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? The apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's two steps to becoming a follower of Jesus. Confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That means he's your boss from now on. And believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you would like to commit to following Jesus for the rest of your life, if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus right now, I invite you to do that. Let's close our eyes across this auditorium, bow our heads. And if God has given you the faith to believe in him, I encourage you to talk to God and make the words that I'm about to say your own and make them a prayer back to God. Say something like this if you're ready to surrender. Jesus, thank you for paying the penalty for my sin on the cross. Thank you for bringing good news to me today. God, thank you for opening up my mind to help me understand the good news of Jesus. And thank you for helping me understand forgiveness of sin. God, I surrender my life to you right now by receiving Jesus as my savior. I commit to following him the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you just said those words, something like those words, making them your own because it matched the faith that was in your heart, if you just said something like that for the first time, the Bible says you are a new creation and we want to celebrate with you. Our prayer team is going to be here at the close of our service. We want you to come down, talk with them, let them know that you just surrendered your life to Jesus. And even you could uh, take one of those connect cards and write out, hey, this is my name. I just gave my life to Jesus today and drop it in the offering box on your way out. I can't think of a greater offering than to say, I gave my life to Jesus today. Let's stand together and let's worship.